There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with a biography of a member of the Russian royal family, Olga Romanov, Russia's last Grand Duchess by Patricia Phoenix. I read this a few weeks ago and really enjoyed it. I'm a royalty buff, not much of a royalist actually, but fascinated by the British royal family in particular, but as you probably know, the European royals are all interrelated. This story is about a royal princess, or grand duchess as they were termed in Russia, a daughter of a czar and a sister of the last czar of Russia, Nicholas II. And she ended up in Canada, living a decidedly unroyal life. So for that reason, I was interested to read this. And this was a buddy read with my similarly royal obsessed buddy reader friend Leah from Canada and we had a really good time. Olga was born in 1882 to the Tsar Alexander III the previous winter. Her grandfather, Tsar Alexander II, had been assassinated, and I knew about that assassination, but I didn't know all the gory details, and they're in the opening chapters, so this just seized my imagination from the get-go. I should say that I studied Russian history as an undergrad and was very interested in it, but haven't really read very much about Russian royalty or Russian history since. And you don't need to have much knowledge about Russian history to enjoy this. The, the key events are explained in a breezy style. It's a very accessible, non-academic biography. There are acknowledgments and a very short... Oh, I guess there are some footnotes. I didn't ever check any of those. For the most part, just a really well-told tale. Events in the young Grand Duchess Olga's life as a daughter of a czar that I didn't know about included a train accident where the royal family were almost killed, including the czar and all of his children and his wife. They still can't decide today whether it was a terrorist attack or an engine failure or something. And those kind of dramatic incidents are really well told. And there were many dramatic incidents in the life of the Russian royals, as I think you are aware. She definitely was a princess. She, As an adult, she was in some ways shockingly flirtatious and le leading a very privileged life. But there were just fascinating anecdotes about her personality, like as the Grand Duchess, as I can't remember, I guess she would have been the Tsar Nicholas's sister at the time. She was standing on the platform of a train station and walked up to a young soldier and started flirting with him and asking him if he knew who she was. She was a real character. And there's a lot of perversion and immorality. Is that the word? Uh, let's go with immorality in all royal families. Uh, boy, the Russians got the Brits beat, I'll tell you. So she got married to some minor royal guy. And he was bisexual, apparently. Or gay. And I'll get back to that because that's one of my few critiques of this book. I'll get to that a little later. And so they didn't, I, maybe they consummated the marriage, but certainly there were no kids. And then she started having an affair with a commoner who was working for her husband. She carried on a years-long love affair with him and eventually, if I'm remembering correctly, strategized to have this guy working and living in the house where she lived with her husband. He did end up living with them and working directly for her husband, but I can't remember if... I think she was the one that pulled the strings to make that happen. So just flagrant. I don't know uh, how much her husband knew. But eventually, many years later, she was divorced from the gay prince and married the man, and that's who she spent the rest of her life with and had a family with. When World War I broke out, Grand Duchess Olga went to near the front and worked as a volunteer nurse. She had some nurse training, I think, and she worked there for months and months and months. And in fact, the last time that she saw her brother, Tsar Nicholas II, was when he visited the hospital where she was working. And in fact, that's when she finally convinced him to give his assent to her divorce. And then a few weeks later, she married her lover and the wedding party was at the hospital. So 
She had a common touch as well. Like she was not just a fixture, a figurehead at this hospital. She was actually doing stuff like the nitty gritty, gory nursing stuff that's involved. She was also nearly assassinated because the revolutionary ferment was building because her idiot brother was mismanaging everything. And somebody tried to smash a huge jar, glass jar of... I, I want to say pickles, but no, it was something hospital related, maybe Vaseline, but it was like this humongous jar and just about smashed it on her head. And then that was a fellow nurse. And then Olga, she moved just in time or something and continued working there for a few more weeks. And then the revolution happened and she, along with her mother and I believe her sister, were imprisoned in several places within white Russia. And it was interesting, from the Menshevik over to the Bolshevik era, the constraints upon the imprisoned royals. So her mother was still alive, the queen mother, the previous empress, the previous Tsarina. I've forgotten her name, Marie, I think. It's fascinating that Olga and her commoner husband were treated better than her more royal relations because she was married to a commoner. The Bolsheviks gave them a few extra privileges. Those members of the royal family separately escaped to Europe and those chapters are among some of the most fascinating suspenseful adventure narratives that I've read fictional or otherwise. She did get to Denmark and then met up with her sister and her mother. After a few years in Denmark during which time her sons you know, their formative years were in exile in Denmark and they married Danish wives and then the family emigrated to Canada and they started farming. Now that's what had always drawn my interest was that this grand duchess became a farmer in Ontario. Well, they weren't much of farmers. They bought property and hired people to farm it, but they were leading very rural country bumpkin lives. I have to say that, not to put my own country down, but once they got to Canada, the book got really boring. Because aside from a royal visit or two, and letters back and forth, their royal life ceased utterly. And they lived country folk life. The more I read the boring parts, and talked to Leah about the fact that it was rather boring, the more I thought, you know, that's kind of the point of this story. That a glamorous, privileged, royal personage... She could have stayed in Europe and lived as her sister did. Her sister lived in uh, the UK until her death. But choosing this path and just kind of disappearing, shaking off all of that royal protocol and privilege. I mean, she had money from jewelry and stuff, and that's all explained in the book. But she just faded into the boring life of being a farmer in Canada in the 19... 40s and 50s until her death in 1960 and that's fascinating i don't know if that would be possible today in the late 1950s during a royal visit of queen elizabeth and her husband prince philip to canada queen elizabeth invited olga to attend a luncheon or something on the royal yacht it was an hour's drive from where Olga was living in country bumpkin obscurity. And Olga was in her 70s at that time. Her husband had died. And she didn't know what to wear. But she decided she didn't need a new dress. She wore a very unfashionable frock and a straw hat. And very shyly went up to the royal yacht. And the guard stopped her and said, Excuse me, ma'am, where do you think you're going? And... She very shyly, in her Russian-accented English, pulled out of her not very fashionable purse the invitation from the queen, and the guard realized that she was actually royalty and apologized and escorted her in. And the queen welcomed her very warmly, to the queen's credit, because she couldn't have looked more out of place. And that guard made a point of attending Olga's funeral a few years later because he just felt so bad the way he treated her. So he was there with all his uniform and regalia and stuff and he wanted to be in, officially involved in her funeral to atone for the slip-up he made. Another fascinating little tidbit. There's just so much here. Now, I didn't like the way the first husband's sexuality was handled. It was, this is a 1999 thing, so okay, but I think she knew more than she thought it was proper to say and that bugs me. 
much is made, there's a thread of the narrative that involves the royal jewels and who got what and who profited from the sale of what that I think she kind of fumbled, the biographer, because it ended so anticlimactically that I just felt, I'm not interested in jewels anyway, but after building all that suspense about and foreshadowing, we wouldn't know until decades later, whatever happened, what did Queen Mary do with blah, 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 and then the final part of that story was so anticlimactic. There was plenty of drama here. It was a fascinating story. She was a fascinating woman, and if any of this strikes your interest, I recommend that you check out Patricia Phoenix's biography of Olga Romanov, Russia's last Grand Duchess. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.